I V M. We're floating in the skies above the coast of a huge continent, looking south. We're watching the shallow waves of a dying ocean as we hear the calls of animals in primeval jungles. It's 50 million years before today, March 27th, 2019 CE. In the distance, in the middle of the water is a huge landmass. It's coming towards us, but very slowly, only a few inches every year. That's not very interesting, is it? Let's speed time up a bit. The island accelerates. We hear a huge groan and almost sense the crust of planet Earth itself bend and deform under the island's immense weight. We watch as the island comes closer and closer to the continent. The ocean between them becomes shallower and shallower and finally vanishes as the two landmasses clash. The island pushes itself deeply into the land. It pushes so hard that the earth and rock around it have nowhere to go except up. Hundreds of millions of tons are slowly raised kilometers into the crystal clear sky and a new range of mountains are born rising majestically above the earth. Ice cracks, avalanches pour, the sun glimmers off their peaks. Millions of years later, they will be called Himalaya. A board of snow, revered as the father of the rivers of this new land that has just been created. We watch snow and ice flurry across the peaks, glittering off the black cliffs. We stare at the silent grandeur of white glaciers. We watch trickles of water melt and slip down the mountain sides. We watch rivers form and flow across the flat lands, carving out a valley, mixing, pouring, soaking into the land's wild forests lapped up by its animals. Millions of years later, they will be called Ganga and Yamuna and their tributaries worshipped as goddesses. We watch the aeons pass. We watch the seas ebb and flow. We watch the sun rise and fall countless times. The temperature plummets as ice ages come and go. New animals migrate from the ice and seek refuge in this land. Lions and tigers and elephants and peacocks, cheetahs and rhinos. Ocean currents plant its course with huge forests of coconut palms and its dry interiors are thick thorny jungles thriving with animals. One of those animals is new. It's called Homo sapiens and having evolved in Africa a few hundred thousand years ago, it has now spread out and reached our land by walking along the coasts of the world. This new species of hairless ape begins to create tools and farms and count the years. Soon it rules mighty cities that trade with each other. The cities collapse and kingdoms form. Kingdoms fight and squabble distracted by their tiny problems even as the huge forces of physics, climate change and evolution continue in the background. Culture and art emerge and flourish. In the 256th year of an era called the Shaka era or 335 CE, a young king in North India of a family called the Guptas embarked on a career that would leave this huge subcontinent transformed. This is his story. I'm Anirudh Kanisetti. Welcome back to Echoes of India, a history podcast. The first season of Echoes of India was a head-spinning journey through 700 years of Indian history from Alexander the Great to the Gupta Empire. I have some good news for you now. The second season won't make your head spin so much. We're going to start where we left off with the rise of the Guptas and hear the stories of the bloodthirsty kings and queens and spectacular temples and wars and sackings and poetry and drama and all the other stuff that's so familiar to Indian history. There's also going to be a lot more familiarity. We're going to chill out and explore this fascinating time. And of course, we'll have our usual truth bombs about things like what ancient Indians thought about sex and how much they liked elephants and so on and so forth. 
what we saw in the beginning of the episode is the creation of one of the world's great geopolitical regions, the huge mountains surrounding the Indian subcontinent and their river basins in the North Indian plains. This fertile, well-connected land was home to some of India's earliest city-states and kingdoms. Over the centuries, these people rose and intermixed and fought battles with themselves and with foreigners, a story that I recounted in detail in the last season. Also in the last season, I kept going on about the Deccan Plateau and its geopolitical importance to India and global trade. This season, I'll keep going on about mountains and rivers and their geopolitical importance to India in global politics and conflict. Okay, so preamble done. Now the important question, who the hell are the Guptas? In the beginning of the 4th century CE, most of the Indian subcontinent would have been asking the exact same question, who are the Guptas? But by the end of this century, most of the Indian subcontinent knew the answer very well. When the Kushanas, a tribe of Central Asian nomads, invaded North India in the 1st and 2nd century CE, they used their deadly cavalry archers to quickly defeat most of North India's dozens, if not hundreds, of cities and states. To rule over these fractious, violent peoples, the Kushanas appointed military governors and subjugated local nobles to perform some basic administration and tax collection for them. And to speak to their new subjects, the Kushanas also patronized Sanskrit literature, which was the language that was being spoken by most North Indian elites, and they also promoted Indian styles and art. Plus, the Kushan Empire had a great deal of control over trade networks all the way from Central Asia into North India. Key cities such as Takshashila, Balkh, Kandahar, Ujjain, and Pataliputra were directly connected into their trade network. So what we see during the Kushan Empire is that all over North India, elites are wealthier and they're also more similar because of the literary and religious culture of the Sanskrit-speaking court. In fact, many later Kushan emperors had names like Vasudeva. Very Indian-sounding names, right? Because it was a very pluralistic time. In Gandhara, Kushan culture mixed with the existing Indo-Greek Buddhist culture and this culture affected North India too. As we saw in our last season, the North Indian war god Skanda, who is the son of the major god Shiva, may have been inspired by certain Kushan gods. But despite all this new innovation and interaction, North India wasn't just sitting around quietly. Of course, all of its local rulers wanted a share of that sweet, sweet global trade. Local rulers grew more and more powerful in relation to the Kushan court. The Kushan Empire began to disintegrate from three sides. Local Indian rulers declared independence in their east, the Persians attacked them from their west, and they are also constantly being raided by new nomad groups from Central Asia. As its influence withdrew, North India moved into a sort of multipolar anarchy. Kind of similar to our world, really. What we see in our world is an aging superpower on its way out and it's leaving behind many distinct successors who want to dominate each other but also have a sort of broad cultural and economic similarity. That's very very similar to what North India was like during the time of the fall of the Kushan Empire. In the Ganga River Valley, tribal republics competed with dynastic kingdoms, oligarchies, wealthy landowners, merchants and mercenary guilds. Basically, anybody who could pay to hire some guys with swords was busy trying to bump off everybody else. Now, one of these wealthy people was a guy called Chandra of the Gupta family. Chandra was, like most wealthy Indian men of the time, an ambitious sort of fellow. In the dying years of the Kushanas, when they had retreated to Gandhara, Chandra got lucky. He married a princess far above his social station. Her name was Kumara Devi and she was the princess of a tribal republic in the Himalayan foothills called the Lichavis. In return for this marriage, the Lichavis seem to have given Chandra control of the ancient Mauryan capital called Pataliputra, a city that was by now almost a thousand years old. I don't know if Kumara Devi and Chandra had a very happy marriage, but it was definitely productive. The couple had at least one son. This son would inherit whatever his father left him, but he'd also inherit his mother's connection to the prestigious Lichavi clan. And so, very interestingly, this son referred to himself not as Chandragupta's son, because the Guptas were still a minor, irrelevant family, right? 
Instead, he called himself Lichavayaha, the Lichavi son, to show that he was closer to his mother's more distinguished family. This Lichavaya was to have one of the most remarkable military careers of all Indian monarchs. But he had to become a king in the first place. You see, his father Chandra would have had many wives from other ruling families that he was allied to. And he had sons from all these other wives as well. And the other wives' families would have tried to get their grandsons appointed as the next king, sending military aid to all of the Lichavaya's brothers. They all banded behind his eldest brother, a guy with the rather uninspiring name of Kacha. But then, you know, Indian personal names tended to be short and simple at this time anyway. The Lichavaya managed to defeat Kacha and Bros in a quick tussle, and now he was crowned Maharaja, Great King. In his earliest coins, he looks like a thin, uncertain young man, even though he wears a military uniform in the Kushan style with trousers, indicating that he might have been some sort of cavalryman. The coins also bear his new, splendid royal name, Samudra Gupta, Sea Guarded though his actual personal name might have been somewhat less awesome. By taking this royal name, the young king seemed to be claiming that he would expand his empire until it bordered the seas. Just to give you a sense of how utterly bonkers that is, imagine someone who wants to conquer half of Europe within a single lifetime while being basically a duke in the southern part of France or whatever. Keep in mind that India was a much more diverse and violent landmass than Europe was. The rest of North India probably didn't even have to worry about this new upstart. Players like the Nagas and the Malavas and the Abhiras and the Arjunayanas and the Prajunas and the Madrakas and the Yadheyas and the Sanakanikas and the Kakas and the Kharapikas and all their countless vassals and local warlords dominated the Ganga Valley. This tiny little kingdom didn't really seem like any sort of threat. But in hindsight, we can kind of see that there was a mistake. Old women in his capital sent him off in a shower of rice grains, like foam flecks on Vishnu raining when breakers from the sea of milk crash on the Mandara mountain. You see, Samudra Gupta's kingdom was a geopolitical treasure. It wasn't a coincidence that this region had been the seat of the most powerful early Indian states, such as Magadha and the Mauryan Empire. Ancient Magadha, in the modern state of Bihar, was well watered by the Ganga's tributaries, meaning that it was fertile but also had maritime highways for transporting goods. That gave it a high population and a healthy economy. It was also close to the productive iron mines and dense forests of Jharkhand, which could provide elephants, timber and other materials needed to supply a military machine. It was the perfect place for Samadra Gupta to recruit a large and effective army, maybe one even capable of taking over North India. But more on that in a bit. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another awesome week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you're not following us on social media, please make sure that you do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. So if you guys haven't been checking our Instagram, you should take a look at the audiograms. We're giving you excerpts from different shows. This is available both on our stories and on our feed. Also, we put these audiograms up on Facebook and Twitter as well. So, I mean, like, do kind of keep an eye out for them. You kind of enjoy them, I think. On Cyrus Says, Cyrus is joined by Abuzar Akhtar, who talks about his difficult journey from a businessman in Dubai to a playback singer in Bollywood. Film producer and close friend of mine, Koki Gulati, also joins in to talk about his discovery of Abuzar. You should also check out episode 350 of Cyrus Says, which was an AMA special. It featured a roundtable of other IVM hosts like Varun Dugirala of Advertising is Dead, Naren Chinoy from Simplified, Dinkar Duvedi from Geek Fruit, and, of course, me and Abbas. Anirudh Kanishati is back with Season 2 of Echoes of India from the 27th of March. On the first episode of the season, Anirudh is going to start from where he left off. The Rise of the Gupta Empire. New episodes are out every Wednesday. On Pulia Bazi, Pranay and Saurabh talk to Disha Malik and Kavita Devi, who run Khabar Laharia, a woman-run rural media network in UP. On Noyer Kanun, Ambarana is joined by wife and model Hasleen Kaur to talk about the safety of women in the entertainment industry. On Football Twaddle, Saru and Kanav talk about last week's FA Cup and EPL action as the race for the title and top four heats up. On Thalle Harate last week, Uday Kumar joins hosts Pavan and Ganesh to discuss the oldest inscription throne in Bengaluru, which opens the historical understanding of the city. On the Sponge podcast, Ambi Parmeshwaran talks about the time when he was invited to present tax collection and communication strategies. And with that, let's continue on with your show. And we're back. So how exactly did these engineering armies work? They had three main components, elephants, cavalry and infantry. 
each of these had an officer to look after them the superintendent of elephants the superintendent of horses and so on and so forth these officers were responsible for the acquisition training and care of animals and men samudra gupta's elephants would have come from jharkhand and bengal either purchased from merchants or directly trapped by his troops after being tightly tied up starved and beaten the elephants were slowly trained to carry riders lift weights move at different speeds and receive orders elephant riders were trained to hurl projectile weapons and goad their animals to charge into enemy weak spots these huge intimidating animals could easily break enemy lines samudra gupta's horses on the other hand would have been imported all the way from central asia from where they'd pass through gandhara and be transported down the ganga on barges horses were really expensive animals because they're not native to the indian subcontinent they have to be imported they were used only for war they were trained to charge scout and run down enemy troops it's possible that due to centuries of central asian influence indian armies at this time also included some horse archers the gupta army is quite likely to have made special use of them for most of its history as we'll see later this season finally the infantrymen who fought in samudra gupta's front line would have come from a variety of backgrounds some of them would be members of professional mercenary guilds some of them from elite hereditary guards some of them were recruited directly from the countryside some were provided by allies and vassals infantry had the worst task of the three branches often they were poorly armored insufficiently trained and they were just disposable blocks of men to be thrown into battle to soak up enemy arrows however some infantry units like the elite hereditary guard or mercenary groups would have been rigorously drilled every single day and responded to a series of musical visual and vocal signals with great precision and discipline their task would have been to overwhelm the enemy line with numbers and weight attempting to create openings for the elephantry and cavalry overall the army would have been commanded by samudra gupta himself with senior commanders consisting mostly of influential members of the court alongside career military officers with titles like mahadandanayaka and mahasandhi vigrahaka some of these men would have grown up alongside the king and together they would have formed a tightly knit and talented team now as i said by this point the ganga valley had been a state of anarchy for about a century and the withdrawing kushanas had left behind them many smaller states none of which was much stronger than the others when they fought states would have had to send out armies thus leaving their own territory open to attacks from other sides they would only join others to fight off a bigger enemy and even then not always conflict tended to be brief rapid raids meant to secure some loot rather than long term campaigns of conquest in the western part of the ganga valley especially constant competition with the kushanas would have weakened most states which meant that the time was right for an attack from the east which was coincidentally exactly where samudra gupta was positioned so thanks to his geographical location with the himalayas guarding his north his capital surrounded by rivers his mother's family protecting his northern flank samudra gupta was able to make very daring moves and move across the gangetic plains His armies burst into the fertile valley attacking his neighbors seizing their territory. Gupta officers were appointed to take care of administration and weak local rulers would have been ordered to present themselves in his camp to swear loyalty to him. As he advanced up the Ganga, increasingly furious and desperate kings formed huge coalitions of armies to fend him off. but it was to no avail samudra gupta was a dashing and daring commander often fighting in the front lines and according to one of his courtiers he was a battle scarred badass he was skillful in engaging in hundreds of battles of various kinds and his body was most charming being covered over with the beauty of the marks of hundreds of scars caused by the battle axes arrows spikes spears darts swords clubs javelins and arrows whether or not samudra gupta actually physically fought hundreds of battles is doubtful but he was definitely one of those rare military geniuses that seem to appear every few generations in history can you imagine how lucky versatile organized and just generally brilliant one has to be to win a single battle 
Now multiply that with maybe 50 or 60 and think about just how terrifying Samadra Gupta's armies would have been. He's supposed to have built bridges with boats, sampled booze from all the places armies sacked. He's supposed to have been invulnerable to arrows, throwing great feasts and celebrations everywhere he went like he was some kind of Indian Genghis Khan. Irrespective of whether any of this is true, Samudra Gupta certainly seems to have had a dangerous reputation. He was a huge political military shockwave. As his North Indian rivals grew more desperate, Samudra Gupta raised the stakes. After defeat, he would have kings killed outright so there would be nobody to challenge his right to their territory. This wasn't really a great idea since most royal families tended to have family members who would seek revenge but it worked wonderfully, terrifying most of North India into submission. Samadra Gupta is recorded to have exterminated no less than 9 kings. Rudradeva, Matila, Nagadatta, Chandravarman, Ganapati Naga, Nagasena, Achyutanandin and Balavarman. After these grisly acts, many of those defeated kings or their successors would have been forced to give their daughters in marriage to Samadra Gupta's brothers and sons and nephews. Just think about it. This dynasty, which had been so low-born that even the emperor didn't use his father's name, was suddenly the most in demand of all of ancient India's political marriage networks. Within two decades, most of the Ganga Valley, the most fertile and urbanized region in the Indian subcontinent, was firmly in Gupta hands. Through their officials, marriage ties and political network, they controlled the sacred ford where the Ganga and Yamuna met. They controlled most of the trade along the superhighway of the ancient world and influenced hundreds of cities and millions of people. And they had done it within the blink of an eye in historical terms. This growing swagger and bluster is quite evident on Samadra Gupta's coins and inscriptions. There was Samudra Gupta, equal to the gods in pleasure and anger. By him, the whole tribe of kings upon the earth was overthrown and reduced to the loss of their sovereignty. He appears more and more as an invincible Indian monarch wearing Indian costumes with bare chest and elaborate jewellery. He's seen playing the lute and his poetic abilities are lauded. Taken together, they reflect an increasingly mature understanding of the position within which the Guptas found themselves. Within a single generation, Samadra Gupta had gone from being the Maharaja of a small kingdom to the Maharaja Dhiraja, the great king of kings of most of North India. He was now at the center of a huge courtly network featuring dozens, if not hundreds of vassals, officials, family members and entertainers. All of these people were part of the Indian subcontinent's broad Sanskrit-speaking elites, all of whom took great pride in their knowledge of fine arts and also in their greed for conquest. Many had at some point been Kushana vassals and maintained considerable armies in their forts, even if they swore loyalty to Samadra Gupta. There was only one language that all these people understood, the language of Thar. And so, I am more powerful than all of you, say Samadra Gupta's coins. I am the most cultured and refined and the one most worthy to rule over you all. There would have been a lot of people who were inclined to agree. He was the most powerful native ruler to control the region in centuries and many rulers swore loyalty to him for that reason alone. The forest tribes of central India and the rulers of Assam and Bengal which were at the time still densely forested acknowledged the Guptas as their sovereigns and paid tribute. More distant and powerful rulers such as the Shakas of Gujarat and the Kushanas of Gandhara who were both central Indian dynasties who were thoroughly Indianized by this point also submitted after a couple of quick campaigns from Samudra Gupta. All this was remarkable enough, right? so keep in mind the guys conquered most of North India, he's defeated the Kushanas and the Shakas who've been in North India for centuries, but Samadra Gupta still wasn't done. He'd gone north, east, west and defeated enemies in every single direction, but the south still remained untouched. In fact, South India hadn't seen any North Indian armies since the fall of the Mauryas hundreds of years ago. So here is Samadra Gupta's most remarkable achievement. A campaign across one and a half thousand kilometers across the east coast of India from Bengal into the deep heart of the Tamil country. 
the Gupta army, swollen like a river in flood with the armies of Samudra Gupta and all his vassals, set out. The huge mass with its hundreds of thousands of men, elephants and horses would have stretched out for miles marching along the Bay of Bengal. The waves of the ocean would almost have seemed as though they were responding to the marching of the troops and the loud, cheerful voices of drums, horns, trumpets, camp followers talking, conversations and officers swearing would have resounded off the soft hills of the eastern ghats as the denizens of South India shivered at this conqueror, so alien and yet somehow similar. Where the river Tamraparni meets the sea, they offered him in homage their hoards of pearls, as also their store of fame. And the dust his soldiers raised took the place of ornaments which Kerala women, out of fear, had discarded from their hair. An expedition of this scale would have taken months, if not years. The Gupta army would have slowly pushed their way down the coast, forcing cities to submit, seizing supplies from the fertile agricultural lands of the coast, leaving villages in ashes. Local kings were forced to band together and attack, or otherwise try to ambush the huge Gupta army. It didn't go too well. As we can see, the list of defeated kings that Samudra Gupta later put up included Mahendra of Koshala, Vyagra Raja of Mahakantara, Manta Raja of Kurala, Mahendra Giri of Pishthapura, Swami Datta of Kottura, Damana of Erandapalla, Vishnu Gopa of Kanchi, Neela Raja of Avamukta, Hasti Varman of Vengi, Ugrasen of Palakka, Kubera of Devarashtra, and Dhananjay of Kushthalapura. If that sounds like a lot, it's because it is a lot. Samadhra Gupta's invasion was one of the most disruptive events that the South would see in centuries. The defeat and humiliation of all these kings allowed their own tinier vassals to break free and go their own way. So just as the Kushan invasion had shattered the warring states of North India and made one of them more powerful than the rest, Samadhra Gupta's invasion would eventually do the same to South India as well. Not that he cared anyway. Samadhra Gupta knew perfectly well that the situation in the north would grow unstable as soon as his own vassals tried for independence and it would be impossible for any of his successors to try and control this distant south when the lucrative north was slipping out of their hands. So he ordered the defeated South Indian kings to pay him tribute, return their crowns and inform them that they were now his vassals. Then Samadhra Gupta withdrew. Towards the end of his reign, with his campaigns completed, Samudra Gupta returned north and ordered the performance of a sacrifice called the Ashwamedha. The Ashwamedha was a wild, violent, extravagant sacrifice that harkened back thousands of years ago when horse-worshipping cultures first emerged in the early Vedic period. It involved setting a white horse free to wander around wherever it wanted, followed of course by an army. If the horse wandered into the territory of another king, that king could capture the horse but only if he also defeated the army following it. On the flip side, if the horse entered someone's territory and the king didn't stop it, then he was basically accepting the horse's owner's right to rule over him. In Samudra Gupta's case, he may have performed multiple Ashwamedhas, each after the ending of a major series of campaigns and each meant to assert his sovereignty over this new territory that he conquered. Of course, no ruler would have been stupid enough to try and grab one of his horses. After wandering around for a year, the horse was brought back. And now this is where uh, most people's knowledge of the Ashwamedha tends to become a little foggy. Now, according to the Yajur Veda, the sacrifice takes a rather, uh, how do I put this, macabre turn. So what happens to the horse once it comes back is that it's strangled to death ritually, marked with golden needles along which it's going to be sliced, then chopped up and cooked. Its flesh is roasted, its blood is poured into the sacrificial flames. According to the Yajur Veda, dozens if not hundreds of other animals are also supposed to be sacrificed, though some sources say that the sacrifice was actually symbolic and used a horse's statue instead. I think it's likely that it was a cruel, smoky, expensive, extravagant spectacle with thousands of onlookers as described by the Yajur Veda for the simple reason that Samadra Gupta came from a new dynasty and had to prove his authority to all the kings he conquered. 
he probably performed one of these sacrifices at prayaga at the meeting of the ganga and yamuna rivers one of the many capitals that the guptas would use over the centuries by the end of samudra gupta's reign the indian subcontinent was transformed the ganga valley which was relatively uniform in terrain was split between gupta vassals and directly administered by gupta officials this core region of the empire was its most urbanized and culturally sophisticated part and was dominated by a series of huge ancient cities such as mathura once the kushan provincial capital in north india as well as kaushambi prayaga and pataliputra this was the heart of the gupta political network connected by roads and rivers so rebellions could easily be crushed and stability and tax income maintained now around this core region around the gangetic plains the emperor arranged frontier regions such as disloyal vassals and forests and desert lands which would be difficult for enemies to cross and also served to protect the imperial heartland these regions broadly governed themselves but their rulers derived authority from samudragupta as maharaja adhiraja great king of kings he was happy to give his loyalists new titles such as maharaja even if they were only the leader of a minor tribe every now and then the guptas might perform a show of force to keep these regions in line and dissuade them from attacking and around even these autonomous regions were the most distant areas which some of the gupta ruled merely in name mostly they just paid him tribute and since they were too far away to attack anyway they were left to themselves Now as you can see at this most abstract level Samudra Gupta's conquests followed a clear logic and objective very obviously he intended to conquer or dominate the subcontinent and he managed to do that quite substantially he made a powerful military administrative and political machine that was capable of enduring serious shocks and this machine would now oversee a network of hundreds of cities and dynasties all interacting and competing not just militarily but more importantly economically and culturally leading to a flourishing and development of ideas that really make the subcontinent world is today as we'll see through this season the sort of threefold organization of the gupta state where there's a core vassals around that and even more distant vassals around that is also a pattern that we're going to see again and again through this season because it's a representation of an indian geopolitical idea called the rajamandala but more about the rajamandala later let's come back to samudra gupta a new pattern was emerging of charming cruel accomplished brilliant kings guided by their charming cruel accomplished brilliant courts Samudra Gupta was merely an example maybe the ideal but he wasn't the first and he wouldn't be the last tens of thousands of men died in his bloody endless campaigns and his entire life may have been little more than an endless series of sackings battles burnings and atrocities but the scars and blows that these thrashings would leave on the subcontinent would heal and eventually adorn it adding new elements to the story making it develop in new ways as the smoky air reverberated with the chanting of sanskrit shlokas samudra gupta may have taken a moment to look at the faces of his hundreds of vassals people that he had crushed humiliated loved cajoled persuaded binding them all together into a single network had been difficult enough but keeping them together was going to be even more difficult i want to hear what you think of echoes keep in touch with me on twitter at akanisetti that's a k a n i c t t i or tag me in an instagram story just search my name if you like this podcast you could also leave us a rating and a review and don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the ivm network you can listen to us on the ivm podcast app or ivmpodcast.com and while you're at it follow us on twitter and instagram as well at ivm podcast hello everybody we have a brand new daily podcast we're working on with bloomberg quint all you need to know provides the top news on business markets and the economy so that you can stay ahead of the curve tune in every morning on bloombergquint.com the ivm podcast app or wherever you get your podcast from Hi my name is Anupam Gupta I'm B50 on Twitter I am the host of Paisa Paisa a show that talks money 
on my show i speak to experts from every field of money and finance from stock markets equities debt funds credit cards life insurance every possible area of money and finance that you can think of we even did an episode on cryptocurrency i've got fantastic guests from mutual funds to personal finance experts everywhere robo advisory startups just name it we've got it at pesa pesa we help you make smart decisions about money you work hard for money now make your money work hard for you new episodes out every monday and you can listen to my show on the ivm podcast app or any other podcasting app that you have